Okay, so when you're identifying igneous rocks and uh, trying to figure out where and how they formed, one thing is the composition, which we just went over. The other thing that you have to look at is the texture of the igneous rock. And when we're talking about igneous rocks or any rock's texture, we're not talking about like how it feels or something like that. We're actually talking about how the minerals inside are arranged. So it's the size and the shape and the arrangement of the little minerals that make up that rock. And when we are talking about igneous rocks, the speed of crystallization is what affects the texture. The faster the magma cools down, the smaller the crystals are, because there's just not a whole lot of time for all those little atoms to arrange themselves into uh, big crystals. So the faster the cooling, the smaller the crystals. So we can, in a very basic sense, break down igneous rocks into two types. We have the extrusive or volcanic rocks. And the volcanic rocks form on Earth's surface. And these are going to have smaller crystals because that magma was erupted onto Earth's surface in a volcano. Earth's surface is very cold for rocks. You know, most magma is 600 to 1400 degrees Celsius. Earth's surface is a whole lot less than that. So it's very cold up here for a rock, for a molten rock, and so it cools down really quickly once it reaches Earth's surface. Thus, these have smaller crystals. Then we have the intrusive or plutonic rocks. And where this term plutonic and volcanic come from, those come from, let's see, that's Greek mythology. Uh, Vulcan, no, or Roman, sorry. Roman, um, Vulcan was the god of the forge and fire, and Pluto was the god of the underworld. And since intrusive rocks are these uh, uh, igneous rocks that cool and become solid underground, they get the term plutonic with them. They cool underground, so they cool slower. And um, that's because they're surrounded by a lot of other rock, they're nicely insulated, so the crystals have time to grow bigger. And um, so when you're looking at uh, an igneous rock, the first thing you might notice is if it has big crystals, you can think it formed underground. If it has small crystals, that should tell you it formed on Earth's surface. Now there are a bunch of different texture terms that will tell you things about igneous rocks. So let's look at all the different texture terms. We have aphanitic. This comes from a Greek root word. Um, phaner means visible. And if you put the prefix a on that, it means not. And so aphanitic means not visible. Or in this case, it's going to be small, hard to see crystals. Again, kind of like this rock right here. And I'm not saying you can't see any crystals. I think I see one right there. But for the most part, they're tiny. And without a microscope, you're not going to be able to see them very well. Now, you can also have porphyritic. And a porphyritic texture is where you have two very distinctive sizes of crystals. You're going to have bigger ones called phenocrysts, surrounded by smaller ones called the ground mass. And porphyritic igneous rocks can form either on Earth's surface or underground. How do you tell the difference? By looking at the ground mass. Here on the left side, this is an extrusive porphyritic rock. We have these bigger white crystals surrounded by these smaller black ones. It's hard to see the little black, the individual little black crystals, so that's extrusive. This is our intrusive porphyritic. We've got these bigger pink potassium feldspar crystals surrounded by these smaller kind of black and white ones. Well, you can actually see and point out the individual little black and white ones. So those cooled a little bit slower, so we know this is an intrusive porphyritic rock. Now we also have what are called phaneritic rocks. There we see that Greek root word phaner. Well, phaner means visible. These are going to be easy to see crystals. They don't have to be big, they just have to be easy to see. 
For instance, on this rock right here, if I said, hey, point to a pink potassium feldspar crystal, you should be able to come up here and be like, right there, and right there, and right there. Right? They're not huge, but you can see them without the aid of a microscope. And then we have what are called pegmatitic textures. And this is where all the crystals are larger than at least one centimeter, but usually they're going to be really big. Um, in fact, right here, this is at a pegmatite in New Mexico. These are feldspar crystals. That's the top of my hammer. So these feldspar crystals are like this big. And some of the feldspar crystals that I've seen there are like 15 feet long. And so in some cases, pegmatites are going to have really, really big crystals. But all of them have to be bigger than at least a centimeter. Now we can also have a texture that is glassy. And this is where there are no crystals, right? The, the um, um, igneous rock just had no time at all for the atoms to arrange themselves in an organized fashion, so we end up with this very glassy texture to it. You can also have what's called a pyroclastic texture. Pyro means fire and clastos means broken in Greek. Broken fire. And that's because these are created when you have a violent, explosive volcanic eruption. And so these pieces are basically blasted out of the volcano. And it's going to be all these little fragments, these little bits and pieces. And then they're going to land on the ground and stick together. And that forms this pyroclastic igneous rock. And this is a very typical pyroclastic texture where we can see all these little different bits and pieces stuck in there. You can also have a vesicular texture. Vesicular contains little holes in it. And this is formed by gases that are bubbling out of the magma. And right here we can see all these little different gas bubbles that got trapped in the magma and uh, uh, formed that vesicular volcanic rock. And then lastly, we can have something that we describe as frothy. This again has gas bubbles, but they're going to be like thousands of little tiny gas bubbles in them. See, all kinds of little tiny gas bubbles. And in fact, in the case of these frothy volcanic rocks, there's so many little gas bubbles trapped in there, the rock's going to feel really, really light, and in many cases, float on water. All right, so what are you going to do in lab? In lab, you are going to be shown um, several different igneous rocks, and you're going to have to figure out what, what rock type they are. And uh, it's not actually going to be as bad as you think, because in this case, you're going to be given a chart, this chart here. And uh, what you have to do first is you have to figure out what the um, uh, texture is. So you'd be like, okay, is it aphanitic or vesicular or porphyritic or glassy or whatever? So you'll look at the texture, and let's say you figured out you have a rock that's aphanitic. Well, then it's going to be one of these rocks in the aphanitic row. The second thing you're going to determine is what's its uh, composition. And this you can figure out based on color. So remember in minerals I said color is not a good thing to use. Well, that's a little different than igneous rocks. You can use color. Uh, if it's light colored or pink, it's going to be felsic. If it's medium gray, it's intermediate. If it's dark, it's mafic. If it's green, it's ultramafic. And so let's say you had an igneous rock that uh, was light colored and aphanitic. You'd be like, okay, aphanitic's in this row. It's light colored, which means it's felsic. And so I follow the felsic column to where it intersects the um, aphanitic row, and that gives me the rock rhyolite. And that's how you'll be identifying these in the, um, in the lab that you'll be given. All right, but there are a few more things that I need to go over. I want to go over a few um, parts to an igneous intrusion. And um, so in these parts of an igneous intrusion, an igneous intrusion or a pluton, uh, those are synonyms, so you can use either one of those. This is going to be a body of igneous rock that forms at depth. So it cools and it crystallizes, it becomes solid deep underground. 
And um, these can be exposed at Earth's surface through erosion um, later on. A good example of that is uh, if you guys have gone and visited like Enchanted Rock out west of here in Hill Country, that is a body of igneous rock that formed many, many kilometers underground, but it was later exposed uh, here at the surface by weathering and erosion. Now these plutons have parts to them, and um, some of their parts are the country rock, the baked zone, the chilled margin, and xenoliths. So let me bring this up here and I'm going to try to explain what some of these things are. Okay, so first of all, we have a few different igneous intrusions. So here's Earth's surface, here's where we're going deeper into the ground, right? This is Earth's surface where we're standing, trees are growing, the black are your igneous intrusions or plutons. Well, what's the country rock? The country rock is whatever rock those igneous intrusions are going into. Now, the baked zone is going to be this area next to your igneous intrusion where that rock didn't melt, but it got so hot from that igneous intrusion that it gets changed in some way. That's going to be your baked zone. Then we have what's called the chilled margin. The chilled margin is going to be just inside this igneous intrusion. It's going to be kind of the outer edge. Well, what happens to create the chilled margin is, remember, the size of the crystal is controlled by how quickly it cools. And the edge of the igneous intrusion touches that cold country rock and cools a lot faster than the center. So the crystals at the edge are going to be smaller. That's your chilled margin. Now xenoliths, xeno means foreign. So a xenolith is a piece of the country rock that gets kind of caught up and stuck. That's not a good color to use, but it's going to be a piece of the country rock that gets caught up and jammed and stuck in that um, uh, igneous intrusion. And let me show you some real life examples of each of these. Okay, got to watch out for the cats here. <clears throat> Okay, so right here we're in Glacier National Park, and this is the country rock, this gray rock. That's a limestone. And this right here, that black rock, is an igneous intrusion. Do you see how right next to that black rock it's white? That's because that limestone got baked by the heat of that igneous intrusion into a metamorphic rock called marble. So that white area right there is our baked zone. Now in this one, we have an igneous intrusion right here. You can see the side of it right there and another side of it right here. This is a feldspar crystal in the middle part of the igneous intrusion. Notice how much smaller the little feldspar crystals are at the edge. And that's because that's the chilled margin, which cooled a whole lot faster than this center part. Um, so there's our chilled margin. Now what about xenoliths? Xenoliths are these pieces of the country rock that get picked up into our igneous intrusion. They can come in all kinds of different sizes. We've got a really big one right here. This is a uh, igneous intrusion of granite or some sort of granitic rock. And this is a piece of the country rock that as that liquid magma was moving upwards, it kind of picked up this piece of the country rock and trapped it in there. And so that is a xenolith. All right, so the last part of, uh, of this lecture on igneous rocks is to look at the different types of igneous intrusions, the different types of plutons we can have. And we uh, categorize these basically by their size and shape. So one type of igneous intrusion you can have is called a dike. A dike is going to be tabular. Tabular means like a book. 
Okay, so a book is narrow in one dimension. It goes longer distances in the other dimensions. That's tabular. These are discordant, which means if you have layers in the country rock, these things cut across the country rock. And they can vary in dimensions. They can be as narrow as uh, like a centimeter and, and go for about a meter in length, whereas some can be a kilometer wide and go hundreds of kilometers in length. So here we have a couple of different dikes. We have the country rock is the black, and then we have this kind of gray dike going this way and a pink dike going that way. Right? Country rock, one dike, there's another dike cutting across. And we have a sill. A sill is very similar to a dike. It's also going to be tabular, except it's going to be concordant. So if there's layers in the country rock, it's going to run parallel to those. And these can have similar dimensions to your dikes. You know, they can be, you know, very thin to very thick. Um, this is supposed to be a picture of a really, really nice sill um, called Kilt Rock on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. The um, only bad thing is the Isle of Skye is well known for fog. And every freaking time I'm there, there's fog. Um, so we're going to have to use a different picture. Let's use a Grand Canyon picture instead. So here's our country rock. That's, these are sedimentary rock layers, and then you see this black rock right there, that's the sill that squeezed its way in between those um, uh, layers of country rock. Now one more interesting igneous intrusion is called a lacolith. This is also concordant, but it's mushroom shaped. So it basically pushes itself into the country rock and then kind of inflates upward into this sort of mushroom shape. So that's what I have on my board right here. I have a dike. Right? It cuts across. And remember, it's tabular, so it would be going into and out of the board. Think of it in three dimensions. So there's my dike. That's my sill running parallel to the layers of country rock. And then right there is my mushroom-shaped lacolith that rose up and then kind of inflated. There are two more types of igneous intrusions. And, um, uh, the ones we've gone over here all have a special shape, but sometimes your igneous intrusion just has a random shape. It, it doesn't look like anything at all. Oh, that's a lacolith, by the way, right? Notice the kind of mushroom shape to it. Well, if you have an igneous intrusion that has just some random shape and is discordant, we call it a stock, right? Irregular shape. It cuts across the country rock, but at the surface, there's going to be less than 100 square kilometers of it exposed. And this is a nice example of a stock. This is Ailsa Craig off the co uh, west coast of Scotland. And um, I'll give you a little Olympic trivia. There is a quarry right there on Ailsa Craig. And if you like uh, the sport of curling, that's on the ice where they've got these stones and they slide them along the ice and they've got the little brooms and they bounce the stones off each other. Curling stones all come from that quarry. And that's because the igneous rock at that quarry has the way the crystals have, have grown together to make that igneous rock. It makes it so the, the curling stones bounce off each other and don't crack and break each other. All right, but what if you have an irregularly shaped igneous intrusion that's discordant, but it's huge? More than 100 square kilometers is exposed. Then we call it a batholith. And um, so the main difference between a stalk and a batholith is the size. I don't have a picture of a batholith in here, but if you've ever gone to like Yosemite National Park in California, you are standing in the middle of something called the Sierra Nevada Batholith, which is just this big area of igneous rock. Actually, Enchanted Rock is part of a batholith as well. Uh, so if you've ever visited there, you're standing just on this huge body of uh, igneous rock. So on the test, I am going to give you a diagram very similar to this, except there's not going to be any labels on it. And you're going to have to be able to tell me, like, okay, this is a dike, right? It cuts across the country rock. This is a sill. It runs parallel. There's our kind of mushroomy-shaped lacolith. There's a stock. 
This whole big body of rock is a batholith. You'll have to be able to tell me that. And uh, so you've heard me mention my cats. I've, I've had cats for many, many years. And I, um, I like to tell you this story here. So um, that is my cat, Sam, who's like somewhere around here. I think she's in the window over there sunning herself. Uh, but that's Sam when we, when we first got her. And I should tell you this story too. It's a story like my granddad used to tell me when I was a little kid. Um, so my, my grandfather was this like big badass Viking guy. Uh, from Norway, and um, anyway, he used to tell me the story of Thor and his cats, and uh, I just loved it as a bedtime story. I had the weirdest bedtime stories, and anyway, this one bedtime story he told me was that Thor was wandering around on um, on Midgard, on Earth, one day, and he found these, like, two orphan kittens, and, um, and being a nice guy, he couldn't just, like, leave these orphan kittens to die, and so he takes them, but then he's sort of like, I'm a warrior, what do I do with orphan cats? And so he takes them uh, to Freya, the goddess of love and everything wonderful, and is like, hey, here, have some cats. And um, she takes care of the cats so well that they grow and they grow and they grow so big that not even Thor can lift them with all of his strength. So anyway, that was a story my granddad told him much, much better than I can. But anyway, I sometimes wonder if I didn't get Thor's cat. That's my Sam today. And uh, I'm told that she's fine and healthy. She's just big. She's like 20 pounds and eats a lot. And anyway, that's my cat. One of my cats. <laughs>